guys. We'll start a meeting, please. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Barnesville Town Council meeting. And here it is, October 19th, 2023. Um, I do want to make a quick announcement in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20. I must inquire whether anyone is recording this meeting, and if so, to please make your presence known. Okay. Not seeing any, could we do a roll call, please? Assistant Town Clerk, Jenna Murphy. Councilors, Atslas. Here. Clark. Here. Cullum. Here. Cusack. Present. Rap Gorsetti. Levesque. Here. Ludkey. Mendez. Here. Neary. Schnepp. Here. Shaughnessy. Here. Starr. Here. Steinhilber. Here. You have 10. Excellent. And uh, Councilor Neary says he's en route, and so uh, he will be here with us momentarily. Um, with that, if we could all please rise with the Pledge of Allegiance. I just want to remember um, conflicts happening all over the world, um, what's happening in the Ukraine, the continued uh, war there with Russia, and just want to um, if we keep uh, thoughts and prayers on what's happening in Israel and Palestine and the innocent people who are losing their lives on an hourly basis there. Uh, if we can just keep that in mind and remember how lucky we are to live in a free country in a wonderful place like Cape Cod. So with that, please, let's take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Be seated. And Councillor Neary, right on cue, has shown us uh, his present on the dais. Welcome, Councillor Neary. So with that, um, now it is time for public comment. So would, if anybody would like to, um, in, in the hearing room first, um, speak during public comment, if you could please come to the podium, sign in your name, if you could let us know, and make sure the microphone's on. Um, let us know, um, again, your name, and um, you would have, uh, preferably, try to keep it under three minutes, please. Good evening. Uh, thank you for all the hard work you all do. Uh, it's not easy sometimes. Uh, my name's Roberta Mock, uh, 80 Greenwood Avenue. I came last night to listen to, um, is it 305, 307 Main Street? Um, I uh, used to work at ccb and t and um, there's a lot of, um, I was looking on the, uh, I'd seen there's a, there's a lot of um, materials that could be reused for, they used to be placed and repurposed, I don't know what you call it, um, down, not Buzz's Bay, born there, it's not there anymore, I think it caught on fire. The, the, where they used to take, you know, beautiful old pieces. I know they do it in Rhode Island too. I've seen, I've seen like Las Vegas um, when they refurbished Las Vegas. It ended up in Rhode Island. People buy it for their houses and so forth. And I just like to see that when they do um, tear down the bank that I used to work at, that I'd like to see, especially that piece about Abe Lincoln. Um, somebody mentioned it. Um, that'd be a good idea to. If the, I don't know if it would cost a lot to move it to the town, town hall somewhere. Um, and just be careful. As well. I, I was wishing I could walk through one more time because I have a lot of memories there. And um, just, I know I will cry. Um, I'd just like to see some of the pieces there. I know there was marble. Um, one time we, we ended up repurposing the marble through a friend because you just hate to see this stuff wasted. And that was one thing I wanted to bring up. Um, I don't know what's going to happen at the dockside, but it grieves me that I can't have a Quahog and a Guinness there anymore. And I just wish that if they, and I, 
I, I know Stu Bornstein from back in the Smith Barney days. I'd like to talk with him personally again. I did tell him this, is that I think that it's sad what he doesn't have the vision that you need to incorporate the public when you do something that is the best view of our Highness Harbor. Um, I'm going to miss being able to sit there and watch the Fagawi come in, okay? That to me, I just hope somehow, I'm going to keep praying on that one. Um, the third thing, all right, I'm a little odd. Um, I was looking at um, turtle crossing signs to put one by Betty's, Aunt Betty's Pond and one on the street. I've called the police twice now. I, at my house, I have the windows open. I can hear them leaving tire marks on the rotary at night, the kids or whoever it is. I don't know what they're doing. It sounds like um, dragway. <laughs> sounds like Daytona, <laughs> Daytona dragway at nighttime. And I know, I don't know, that won't help. But even during the day, people, if I just like, if we put a turtle crossing sign there, there's a nice one by Aunt Betty's Pond. And one also, I got hit coming out from the symphony for the pops at the Melody Tent from that parking lot. I got hit, and I was stopped, and the guy was just barreling down that road there on Scudder and hit me. And because I was taking a left, it was my fault, but I would like to see one there because there's two creeks that, you know, and there are turtles on Twin Brooks. Uh, I don't know if they're endangered. I haven't seen them, but I, I, we, we talked to people to say they're seeing these turtles. I Could you wrap tried, it up, please? Okay. We, I've tried to get the state of Massachusetts down there to see if they are the, an endangered species, but... I, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mock. Anyone else in the hearing room like to speak from a comment? Hi, I'm Patricia O'Connor, and I'm from Osterville. I, I'd just like to present to this council that um, I'm not against the windmills at Dallas's Beach. I think they're doing... What, what they can, and I think they're doing it properly. I'm not against that. What I am against terribly is tearing up Wayano Avenue and Osterville Barnstable Road. Osterville is a walking town. Everybody in Osterville walks through town all the time, not just June to September. People walk all year round, and there are a lot of elderly people there who don't drive anymore. So they walk, they walk to the library, they walk to the post office, they walk to the little stores. And if you, if you allow Avangrid to go down West Main Street, it's going to take three years, and it's gonna tear up our town. Now, I don't know if any of you remember the A&P in Osterville. So that left, and everybody got very used to going to the stop and shop. So when the other market opened up there, although they were not stocked well, but People were so used to going to Stop and Shop, they didn't really go to that market. And I'm afraid that's going to happen to our stores in Osterville. You know, three years doesn't seem like much, but then you have to build your clientele again. And people will get used to going to Abishan hardware store, and they'll get used to the people there. So they won't come to our, our hardware store anymore. And it's, it's hard for me to see you tear up that street when Old Mill Road is really... I've already measured that, is a mile shorter for them to go Old Mill Road than to go down an Osterville Barnstable Road. And it will affect one quarter of the number of people than if you close down Main Street in Osterville. It just would be a shame. I mean, my, my children come to visit, and they don't, do, they don't always shop in town, but they love to walk through town. My grandchildren will ride their bicycles. Um, if Avering Grid comes through there for th digging up things for three years, and we don't, the sewer pipes they're talking about aren't going to help that many people. They're going down Main Street. They're not, <laughs> it's not really going to help a lot of people in Osterville. And our bays so far have been pretty good. We haven't had an algae problem. Now, we have an algae problem in Parker Pond, but that's the only one, and that's really not going to be affected by these sewer pipes. On top of that, it's going to take twice as long. They'll dig down for the sewer pipes, put them in. Then they have to cover them up. Then they have to dig again to put down the cables. It's going to take forever. And other towns are going with these um, watershed permits. We could do that for another 20 years. And Osterville doesn't really need 
to have Avangrid put in our sewer pipes and disrupt our entire town and all the businesses there and all the people who live there and who love to walk through town. We have people come, I have people come just so they can go through town because it's a little town and they've got a lot of shops you can go in and out of and restaurants there and I'm just afraid if you shut down that main street when there's such a great alternative to go the other way and it's shorter and you take down Osterville Barnstable Road, how are people going to get into town? They're going to have to get their GPSs and take back roads, or they're going to get stuck in traffic on 28. Could you wrap it up, please? I'm sorry, you're over Yes. Anyhow, I just hope that you all will take that into consideration, because I think it would be a shame to shut down our town. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Hi, Mark Wharton in West Barnstable. I live on Route 6A, where we probably have the largest pollution problem on the north side of the town of Barnstable. Um, I'm asking the town council to direct the town manager to get hold of the state highway through probably our DPW and get up here with some plans and some schematics and some sketches to fix the problem they created 90 years ago. So it all started around the 1930s when the state said they were going to straighten Route 6A and put in a drainage system at the intersection of 6A, 132, and Oak Street. So when you're at the end of Route 132 with the stop sign, you see those two big green islands. And that's where the hill was because the east and west lanes were right in front of you. And the state blew the hill back, created the islands, and created a westbound lane to straighten 6A. That's how they straightened 6A. And then they, they built a drainage system from up near the community college all the way down 132, including all of the intersection, and headed it west past Buttonwood Lane into Patrick Page's backyard. And it's been there ever since. All the cigarette butts and the tons and tons of salt and sand put down by the state and the town in the winters is all flushed down into his yard and into our great marsh and into the shellfish beds and into the commercial shellfish beds. And it's been 90 years, and it's about time they came and fixed their problem. So that's the issue, and uh, please give us the help you can give us. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Good evening, town councilors. Chuck Tuttle, longtime Central resident. It's great to see you all here tonight. I want to say thank you for all your efforts. We are all in favor of reducing greenhouse gases and increasing clean energy. The huge Spanish energy conglomerate, Iberdrola, through their subsidiary, Avangrid, proposes to bring 2 billion watts of electrical transmission cables ashore at Craigville Beach and Douses Beach. On Monday, October 23rd, 6 p.m., next Monday, at Barnstable High School Performing Arts Center, we will have a public meeting to allow Barnstable residents to ask questions and voice concerns about the proposed continued industrialization of their recreational areas and residential neighborhoods. I hope that every town councilor attends. I'm optimistic that this will be a productive meeting. It takes some energy and effort to put a meeting like this together. And of course, it's important to get the word out to make sure people know that it is happening. To that end, several residents have been distributing leaflets to their fellow citizens and encouraging to them to attend the event. I've taken a few hours and distributed informational leaflets in Centerville and Osterville. The vast majority of taxpayers and residents that I have talked with are totally unaware of this proposed project. They have no idea. My conversation with them was the first time they had ever heard of it. And why is this? Why are people unaware of such an enormously impactful project? Because they are busy running their businesses, raising their children, living their lives. And they, they don't pay attention because they trust you. 
They trust their town councilors to do the right thing and say yes to development that improves their communities, ensures that they have clean water to drink, improves housing availability and affordability, improves the roadways, improves their quality of life. And they trust their town councilors to say no to development that industrializes their recreational areas, jeopardizes their health, health, compromises their environment, reduces their property values, and increases their utility bills. Most people don't have time to get involved in town business, myself included. A few months ago, I realized the enormity of this proposed industrialization and knew that I had to stand up and do something to stop it. We have 800 million watts running under Coval's Beach from offshore wind farms. That's more energy than the Pilgrim nuclear power plant ever produced. Barnstable has done its part. We as a town need to figure out how to stop the further industrialization of our seaside villages, recreational areas, and historic main streets. The potential financial benefit promised by the increasingly weak contractor who proposes to do this project is pennies compared to the impact that this industrialization will have on our communities. We are selling our souls for cheap. Please, let's work together and communicate to the state agencies and federal authorities that Barnstable has done its part. Let's not let the town of Barnstable be the victim of overly aggressive, some say unrealistic, state and federal mandates for clean energy. You're Working over together, time, please. Thank you. Thank you. Working together, we can stop the further industrialization of our seaside villages. There are better ways to bring billions of watts of energy ashore. I'm looking forward to seeing you all next Monday, the 23rd at 6 at Barnstable High School. Everybody's invited. Please come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toe. Asia Graves, resident of Hyannis. I am not gonna talk about housing first today. I wanna talk about something a little bit different, medical marijuana. Now, I know some people are gonna be like, why is she bringing that topic up? I'm a medical patient who lives in Barnstable County. I lived in Boston, LA, other areas. I had access to my medication. Living in Barnstable County, I don't have access to my medication. Uh, in order for me to get my medical marijuana as a non-driver, I have to take one of those little buses to all the way out to Sandwich. And if you don't have a way to get to Sandwich, which a non-driver, most of us don't have ways to get there, we can't get access to our medicine, which as some, I luckily go to Boston and buy in bulk. So I have that privilege to be able to do that, but the veterans, your seniors, and others don't have, may not have that privilege and they're not getting access to their medication. I know that we are zoned for a dispensary and things of that sort. I would like to see if we can, we may not get a dispensary, but if we can have the town manager look into changing it so that dispensaries can deliver to medical patients here. I have a medical card. I went through my state process. I've done, I jumped all the hoops. The dispensaries have jumped the hoops. Why can they not deliver it to my door? They should be able to deliver my medication to my door like they can do in any other county. Barnstable voted years ago, a couple of years back, to block delivery for medical marijuana of our hyannis. So I'm hoping that we can look into making it so that we can have delivery for medical patients. I think it's simple. Do you want me to go and buy street weed from drug dealers? As someone who has been involved in the criminal element as a survivor of trafficking, this is the region of the country that I would say as a drug dealer, let me set up shop here in Barnstable. There's no medical dispensary. This is an easy market to bang out and make all the illegal money. So if you want to continue to have these drug dealers keep coming in our town and making all the profit where Barnstable's not getting any of the tax revenue, we could be funding housing projects, paying for roads, paying for our sewer system with the money for medical marijuana delivery as a ta form of a tax. So I'm hoping that's something that could be looked into because as someone who gets medical marijuana, I would say, 
hey, you don't want the drug dealers just to keep making all of the money. We should be making the money and making the market legal and safe. I don't trust buying weed from drug dealers because I don't know where my weed is coming from. So we need to make it. We have a whole large senior population here. And can we also get an under 40 committee? We have a council on aging, councils for everything else, but there's nothing targeted to the under 40 demographic. In the wintertime when Main Street slows down, there's nothing for people under 40 to do here. And there's nothing for teenagers to do here. You should get to wrap it up, please. Thank th you. So those are just my viewpoints. And of course, as always, thank you. We need more housing. And thank you for uh, making it so we can get 307 Main Street. We need that form of housing. Hopefully you guys... And whoever is on the new town council, if you all are, make sure that we get more affordable workforce housing because it's desperately needed. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Graves. Anybody else in the hearing who would like to speak during public comment? You're not seeing any. Does anybody like to participate remotely, Director? Boyle? There's no one on Zoom for public comment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody who participated in public comment. And now it is time for response to public comment. Anybody to my right would like to respond to public comment? Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you, Mark Wartman, for uh, bringing this issue before the town council. As I go knocking on doors for this campaign, I have heard similar. Um, um, concerns about the that section of Route 6A, and uh, perhaps I should set up an appointment with uh, DPW director to um, discuss um, what the uh, state's plans are for that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clark. Anyone else? Okay, looking to my left, anybody like to respond to public comment? Okay. Um, I would just like to thank everybody um, for coming to public comment, and I would encourage anybody to The um, if I would just encourage anybody like um, if you have any questions about certain things, definitely follow up with your uh, your counselor for your precinct in regards to certain concerns. I think some of the things that were brought up specifically. Um, I, I if, if you want, I mean, I know if you want, I can, Ms. O'Connor. Um, a lot of the things that you mentioned, quite honestly, some of that information is a little bit. Um, uh, skewed and like this, so like we're not um, there's no definitive plans necessarily for anything with Commonwealth Wind right now so a lot of that's just completely open ended at this point I've, I've talked to them they've already surveyed Main Street too. I, I, an, I understand but at this point in time it's it's so far down the road is what I'm saying so to say we have a definitive answer for any of the things that you might have said you know what I mean or a, anything else sometimes when we don't respond it isn't because um, it's just that it would take a whole nother meeting to try to answer that. That's why I was just going to say, if you have questions and you feel like they're not answered, contact your, your counselor and have a conversation with them in regards to that, and you will get more definitive for um, information. It would give them time to be able to um, contact the DPW director, get those plans out. We are your representative, but we don't always have all the answers. And every one of us would be honest with you to say that. We're, we're not the engineers and things of that nature and to get you those. And we're not at every um, meeting that you've been to with Avant Grid and things of that nature. So we don't even know what they told you. Do you follow what I'm saying? So to get a definitive answer to that, follow up with your counselor. And I can tell you, Council Cusack will, will give you the information that you need as quickly as you can. You're welcome. So um, we try to make everybody happy uh, as much as possible, uh, but at the same time, uh, sometimes that isn't possible. So we do the best we can. Uh, so, with, so, um, and again, lots of different you know things brought up. Obviously, um, Mr. Tuttle brought up the meeting this coming Monday. Um, and looking forward, really, I think this is an opportunity for our council to um, be able to, and our staff, to be able to have a, a room full of people that have questions in regards to something that, quite honestly, we're not the proponent of, right? So we're just moving forward, and um, but it's something that we can uh, come together and uh, you know address any concerns that we have and, and direct those to the right parties, be it Avant Grid, be it the state, be it the federal level, whatever it might be. So looking forward to that. Okay, 
That being said, um, now it is time. I'm just going to take a quick break, and we're going to invite the, um, now it's time for our joint meeting with the school committee. So let's take a quick break for a couple of minutes, invite them up, and then um, uh, we'll start with our joint committee, a joint meeting with the school committee. Thank you. Councilors, school committee members, if you could please make your way to the dais.
Yeah, no, uh, yeah. I was going like to welcome everybody back to our town council meeting for October 19, 2023. Now it is time for our annual joint meeting with the school committee. This joint meeting of the town council and school committee is to review the financial condition of the town revenue and expenditure forecasts and other relevant information in order to develop a coordinated yeah, budget. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce the chair of the school committee, Michael Judge, and to open uh, the meeting and uh, to call to order and roll call. Thank you, President Levesque. Um, I'll open up the uh, joint meeting of the Barnstable School Committee and Town Council for October 19, 2023. Roll we'll call vote, vote. Andre? Here. Peter? Yes. Kathy? Here. Chair is here. So four are here. So that meets our quorum. Thank you very much. So now our joint meeting is, is open, and I'd like to introduce um, our director uh, of finance, Mark Milne, here, and also Assistant Director Gareth. Mark Welt also, and welcome and thank you. And you can start your presentation, please. Thank you, President Levesque. Good evening, counselors, school committee members. Pleasure to see you all this evening. Um, this annual ritual that we have is to get uh, to start our budget planning for the following fis fiscal year. Um, next slide, please. Um, President Levesque already made uh, his comments during opening remarks of why we have this meeting. It's under our Section 6-1 of our charter. So we'll start off, first of all, by just reviewing the financial condition of the town. Um, we have several metrics that we use to, to, to review our financial condition, the first one being um, our bond rating. Every year, we're a, we're a major player in the municipal bond market. We have a significant capital program. Every time we issue a bond, we have to have a rating agency review our financial condition and other uh, information in order to assign a rating to that bond. So it's kind of like our financial or our, our credit rating, our financial report card. Um, Standard & Poor is the agency that we use. And once again, in uh, 2023, when we issued our last bond, we received the AAA rating, the highest rating you can get with a stable outlook, which is also, um, the outlook is also a measurement that they provide you. Um, you could go from stable to um, negative if there's a change in your economics, uh, economic conditions, for example. But we are AAA with a stable outlook. Um, reasons for that um, rating include strong wealth and income levels, um, a comprehensive set of formalized financial policies and practices. We have a history of strong budgetary performance, um, maintenance, str history of maintenance of strong reserves, and we have in their determination manageable pension um, and debt, uh, debt burden and OPEB liabilities. Um, about 60% of their rating is made up of looking at our local economy as well as our financial measures, and about 20% of their rating is, is into, looks at the management practices and how we're, we are managing those financing those finances, and the last 20% is, is looking at our debt and contingent liability profile and our institutional framework. And in Massachusetts, you're working in an institutional framework which basically is governed by Proposition 2.5, provides really a predictable and stable revenue source for most communities in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts, is consider Massachusetts communities are considered working with a very strong institutional framework overall. A second metric that we use to, to measure our financial condition is our annual financial audit. The last audit we had completed was in June of, uh, for fiscal year ending 2022. We are currently under audit right now um, for the fiscal year 2023. Um, but our last audit um, conducted provided us with an unqualified opinion. This is the opinion, this is considered a clean report. It's also the type of report that every entity strives to receive. Um, an unqualified opinion doesn't have any adverse comments in it, and it doesn't include any disclaimers about any clauses or the audit process. In addition, we are subject to a single audit. Um, a single audit is an organization-wide financial statement and federal awards audit of a non-federal entity that spends $750,000 or more in federal funds. It is intended to provide assurance to the federal government that a non-federal entity has adequate internal controls in place and is generally in compliance with program requirements. 
for this past several years, we have received no findings and no questioned costs in any of our federal grant programs. And those stretch across many departments. School department is one of the biggest federal grant recipients every year. Our airport receives a lot of federal grant money, for example. But we have never had any questioned costs or findings. So we score very well there. Some of the highlights from our last audit include an increase in $64 million in our net assets, um, an increase of $12 million in governmental funds, and a 2% increase in our general fund balance compared to our general fund operating expenditures. So we are an upwards trend in all three categories, all positive financial news. Another metric that we use to assess our financial condition is our budget performance. We just closed fiscal year 2023, and as this table illustrates, every enterprise fund operation and the general fund all had a favorable budget variance. Um, the general fund had a $12 million budget variance. Um, so this, this illustrates that even though we use surplus to balance the budget, we were still able to generate surplus resulting in a favorable budget variance. So all positive news. Revenues were trending well. We had some returned, appropriation, returned appropriations under each operation. Um, the only fund that did not have an actual surplus was the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. They used about uh, $5,000 to um, to, for their operation, but we budgeted 371,000 to be used. They didn't use nearly that, they only used 5,000. So that's a favorable budget variance. Another metric we use to assess our financial condition is our free cash. Free cash is cash sitting in the treasury that is unencumbered by any obligation against it. So um, that's really the, the short definition of free cash. Um, Every single fund had an increase in their free cash certification as of July 1, 2023, with the exception of the Golf Course Enterprise Fund. The increase is mainly a result of favorable budget variances that I showed you on the previous slide. The only fund that did not see an increase in its um, free cash was the Golf Enterprise Fund, and that's because we used about a million dollars to pay for their fiscal year 2024 capital program, and so we had to set that aside from their cash at the beginning of the fiscal year. So that's why there's a decrease of $284,000 there. As a percentage of the operating budget, we strive for four to six months of operating expenses for our enterprise funds. So that's anywhere from 33% to 50% of free cash um, um, available for uh, the operating budgets. And as you can see, all of our enterprise funds are within that range with the exception of the Highness Youth and Community Center. In fact, five of our enterprise funds have over 100% of their operating budget in free cash. And that will be used for future significant capital improvements that are intended um, for in some of those funds. The general fund is much lower. Our policy is 4% to keep 4% in a reserve for the general fund, and that's typical for municipal government's general fund operations. They're much smaller because the main revenue source we have, again, is property taxes, which is a very stable revenue source. Your enterprise fund operations are really dependent upon one single source of revenue that they generate. The general fund gets state aid, lots of different local receipts in addition to that stable property tax revenue source. So as, when it comes to our reserves, we, the traditional thinking of what the reserves are, are set aside for is for one-time expenses, some startup funding for new programs, uh, stabilize rates, um, and pay for future liabilities. But we've incorporated additional thought process in managing those reserves, particularly around a, using them as a risk management tool. Uh, we have cash flow risks. Um, our general fund property taxes come in once every quarter. Um, many of our enterprise funds receive a significant amount of their revenue one time during the year when transfer station stickers renew, for example, slips renew in our marinas, you know, golf memberships renew in the golf course enterprise fund once a year. So you have to have enough cash on hand to get you through the slow months until you start collecting the revenue from the renewals of memberships, for example. 
So cash flow risk is one risk we're guarding against when we're thinking about how, we, how much reserves we need to have on hand. Another one is revenue instability. Recessions occur. We could have a contraction in some of our revenue sources. Um, we could also have a changing political environment at the state level, which could affect our state aid. So we have to assume some risk there and how much, what is our risk tolerance and how much reserves do we want to maintain to protect ourselves against revenue instability. Another thought process that we, that we use is um, what's our risk tolerance for uninsured events? We have, uh, we're susceptible, of course, to natural disasters. Things are happening. Weather intensity is increasing across the country. We saw what happened in Lemonster in the middle of the state. And, and so you have to have some kind of risk tolerance in place for how much you're willing to keep in reserves to protect you against disasters like that. Um, many times, federal or state aid could kick in to help you with those disasters, but it could be years before you receive that money, so you need a cash uh, resource to draw against to, p to pay for expenditures that you're incurring to, during the middle of the cleanup. In fact, we just received our FEMA reimbursement for our COVID-related expenditures from three years ago. It took us three years to get that money, uh, so it takes time. So you have to have a reserve in place. And finally, um, there are certain um, events that we, um, we self-insure ourselves for, like workers' compensation. And so we have to have, uh, we can't really affect, we can't buy a policy to cover us for workers' compensation, so we have to self-insure ourselves for that. So these are some of the other reserves that we have in place. Um, most of these are used for operating purposes. Um, the first four are really for our capital program. Um, these help manage um, the significant amount of capital projects that we have planned for the next five years, or at least scheduled for the next five years. We don't have enough resources to fund it all, but we do have some resources here to help us manage the implementation of that. Um, of course, the Community Preservation Fund has almost $10 million set aside in its undesignated fund balance, and that's specific for specific purposes listed here. Um, the good news there is that the land bank bonds that we had outstanding from 20 years ago are mostly all paid off. And so that program is going to have a lot more um, funding available going forward for these particular purposes. Um, the OPEB liability is for a long-term liability. Um, that's traditional thinking. Um, we're trying to bank money to pay for a future unfunded liability that we're committed to for health insurance. And finally, workers' compensation, as I mentioned, that's something that we're self-insured for, so that $4.2 million is there to help pay for the annual cost that we incur for employees who go out on injured leave. Next, we have uh, one other potential revenue source that could help increase or strengthen our reserves, and this is the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Fund also known as ARPA funds. Um, Barnstable received almost $7.7 .7 million in an allocation. Communities who received $10 million or less can elect to use those resources as a replacement for lost revenue, which Barnstable did, meaning that we could use them for any general government service with only two exceptions. We can't pay jet debt service with it, and we can't pay off anything towards our unfunded pension liability with it. So we have strategically used this um, for the biggest project here um, for quite some time is the digitization of our records across many departments. I think we're down to the town clerk perhaps is our last department that we're digitizing records for now. So that's almost complete. But we also had several positions in our IT departments, our police department. We had a grant coordinator in planning and development that we we created those positions and funded them initially with this revenue source, but that's all been migrated over into the operating budget as of fiscal year 24, so no more salaries are being charged um, to this um, grant uh, resource anymore. So we're left, we, we, we're projecting we'll have about $4.2 million of unobligated ARPA funds at the end of this fiscal year. Our plan is to charge off some the for example, $4 million of health insurance costs to that remaining balance. And what that will do will allow us to 
put that unexpended health insurance cost back into our general fund reserves, and then we're not tied to a deadline because these funds have to be expended by December 2024. This way we can get them expended, bank them in our general fund reserves, and then bring that money back to the town council for a specific project for your appropriation uh, authority because general fund reserves are subject to your authority for appropriation. That way we, we avoid the deadline, we put the money in our reserves and we can use it, we can strategically for some project or projects in the future. This time I'm going to turn it over to Gareth, who's going to talk a little bit about our property taxes and how they're trended over the years. Good evening, uh, Gareth Markwell, Deputy Finance Director. Um, again, as Mark had mentioned earlier, uh, we collect revenue from various sources uh, annually, but uh, the property taxes is by far the, the largest of those categories. Um, if we look at our tax levy from FY15 through FY24, we're looking at a levy of $107 million in FY15 and up to $145 million in FY24 projected. That's not by no means the uh, maximum amount that uh, we could levy, obviously with our override capacity um, being up close to uh, a total of $574 million um, this year. Our tax levy has, grow, uh, has grown uh, on average 3.4% annually um, and we're currently taxing at about 26% of, of that capacity. Um, so again, we have plenty of room there. Um, to put it in perspective, we've had a valuation growth which drives that levy um, from $12.6 billion um, in FY15 to uh, just over or just under $22 billion in FY23. So uh, you can see some significant growth there. Uh, looking at the chart, FY22 to uh, 23, you can see the, the large growth there. Again, uh, largely due to the increased value assessments within Barnstable. Looking at current debt exclusions, uh, we currently have one debt exclusion uh, included in our tax levy. That's for the Cape Cod Regional Tax School. Uh, that came online in FY uh, fiscal year 20. Um, we had prior to that uh, two overrides, one for the middle school and one for the high school. Um, they fell off around the same time as the uh, Cape Cod Tech School uh, had their referendum and uh, re somewhat replaced that uh, override. Um, the debt exclusion is variable year to year, largely based on the assessment from the Tech School, which is driven by October 1st enrollment each year. Um, as an example, our 1.7 million assessment uh, in fiscal year 24 was up 2% from 27% to 29%, um, and that was due to an increase in students. Um, FY23, it looks like we have about 193 students there. So we're somewhat vulnerable uh, in that that exclusion is derived from the number of students annually at that school. So it's, we uh, monitor that closely year over year. Our tax rates, um, largely stable year to year. You can see in the graph that in fiscal years 21, 22, and 23, we start to see a downward trend in the tax rate. Um, unfortunately, that does not translate to a decrease in everyone's tax bills. Um, it doesn't change the levy, just our assessed value has increased at a uh, higher level, and so it brings the actual tax rate down. Um, in FY24, we're assuming a 10% uh, increase in residential values, 2% in commercial, industrial, and personal property, and we're assuming a 20% 20 uh, 20 residential exemption in this uh, graph. Uh, I believe next month there will be the actual tax rate setting. Our tax levy distribution. Um, we collect taxes mainly from residential properties, FY23, just over $125 million, um, and that has split with commercial properties at, with just over $15 million. Interesting, we have in FY21 and 22, uh, sorry, FY22 
22 and 23, we actually have a decrease in commercial, industrial, personal property uh, levy amounts, and uh, largely due to the fact that our residential property values have grown at a pace faster than that of the uh, commercial properties. Um, so you see that, that movement of the levy over to the residential category as opposed to the commercial side. New property tax growth. Um, again, new property ta tax growth um, isn't the reassessed value. It's actually uh, related to um, exempt properties returning to the uh, tax rolls, um, new subdivisions, um, condominium conversions, um, large scale renovations. Um, we have averaged about 1.1 million over the course of the, uh, the time on the screen here from FY06 to 25, we're projecting. Um, we currently budget about 750,000 annually um, in new growth. Again, this does not include revaluation. It's purely kind of new construction. Uh, top taxpayers in Barnstable. Uh, we're looking at the top 10 taxpayers in Barnstable uh, contributing to about 3% or just over 3% of the total assessed value in the town. Um, this is spread amongst utilities, shopping malls, shopping centres, apartments, uh, and golf clubs. Um, we expect in FY24 to see Vineyard Wind hit the list in around the fourth spot as uh, we as they bring online their projects and uh, we assess value to those, that property. Um, major changes in FY, from FY 23 to 24, um, the Wiano Club, I believe, replaced Cape Cod 5 in, in one of those lower spots there. Um, again, a, a, variable, a very favorable position for us, um, kind of under 4%. Um, in assessed values, we were not concentrated on any one entity or individual um, in our tax base, so was, there's less vulnerability there for, on a, from the town's perspective. I'll pass that back to Mark. Thank you, Gareth. So looking at some of our other major revenue trends, um, the second highest, uh, or third highest source of revenue now, used to be the second highest, but now it's the third highest, um, is motor vehicle excise tax. This has been on an upward trend um, as illustrated in this chart. Um, we used a very conservative estimate in fiscal year 24 of about eight million. We took in over nine million the two previous fiscal years. So we have capacity to grow that revenue estimate. So we're projecting to move that from eight million to eight and a half million in fiscal year 25. And this is largely due to the trend in vehicle sales. As this chart illustrates, vehicle sales are strong across the country and our motor vehicle excise tax I'm sorry, my mic went off. Oh, yeah. my, our, our motor vehicle excise tax has trended similarly to the way vehicle sales have trended um, on a national basis. So as you see here, there's an upward trend over this two-year period, and our motor vehicle excise track, uh, tax has correspondingly trended upwards. Chapter 78 for education. This is now our second largest revenue source of state aid. Um, this is mainly a result of the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act, which began in fiscal year 22. Uh, fiscal year 24 is the third year of implementation. It's a six-year plan, so we have three more years, 25, 26, and 27. We saw significant increases in this revenue source in 23 and 24, a $5 million bump in 23, $6 million in 24. This revenue source used to represent about 15% of our local school's operating budget. Now it represents closer to 30% um, because of the Student Opportunity Act and the additional funding provided from the state uh, from that act. We are projecting about a $3 million increase right now um, for fiscal year 25. 
it's likely to be more than that, more likely than not to be more than that. Um, the October 1st enrollments were just released and provided to the Department of Education, and they will be using those October 1st enrollments and giving them, um, uh, putting them into the Chapter 70 formula to determine what the new allocations will be for fiscal year 25, which will come out in January sometime. But we are optimistic that um, we will see at least a $3 million increase in this, in this funding source again for fiscal year 25. Meals tax revenue is trending upwards um, over this period of time. You can see the, the blue line represents the total revenue collected for every fiscal year. We did have you know, a, a decrease during the middle of COVID in 20 and 21, but it's back on the upwards trend over the past few years, and we continue to project it to go in an upwards trend um, for, the, for fiscal year 24 and 25. Same thing with rooms tax revenue. We have, um, for traditional lodging that goes into the general fund, we had uh, you know, slight decline, declines in fiscal year 20 and then a large decline in fiscal year 21 due to COVID. But then it bounced back in fiscal year 22 and 23. And we have you know, a, a little bit more of a conservative estimate for 24 and 25 than where we came in in fiscal year 23. Same thing with traditional lodging that goes into the sewer construction and private way uh, special revenue funds, same kind of trend as the general fund lodging. And vacation rentals. Um, that category of, rent, of uh, tax revenue began in fiscal year 20. That was the first year of implementation. And then you can see it, it's trended upwards in 21, 22, and 23, and we're projecting a slight decline in 24 with a slight increase after that in 2025. Building permit revenue is another major source in the general fund operating budget. As you can see, this is trended upwards, um, and then in fiscal year 23, we had a significant increase in this revenue source. I have to qualify that because that came from one big permit, essentially. Cape Cod Healthcare's new tower in Hyannis paid over an $800,000 building permit fee. So we can't expect those to occur year after year. However, we are optimistic that we can grow that revenue estimate from 24, which was set at about 1 million, 1.2 million, to FY25, we're increasing it to 1.5 million. Investment income, another change here. Uh, markets, you know, the, the federal government has increased uh, interest rates for the past two years um, on a regular basis. This impacts the costs of how, we, how much we can borrow money for, but it also offers us the opportunity to invest our excess cash on hand um, in, in investments that return higher rates of return. So we have seen a jump from about 600,000 collected in fiscal year 22 to over $2 million collected in fiscal year 23. We conservatively estimated this at 500,000 for 24, so we have a lot of capacity here to go north with this revenue estimate, and we did so in our preliminary planning for fiscal year 25 by bringing that revenue estimate up to $1.5 million. And Gareth will now talk about some of the general fund expenditure drivers that we're looking at. Yeah, so when we look at general fund uh, on the expenditure side of the equation, um, obviously the first thing we always need to look at is salary and wages. We, uh, in municipal government, it's a very uh, personnel heavy operation. Um, so again, salary and wages contribute to about 70, just shy of 70% of our operating budgets. Um, FY24, our total budget was about $105 million, uh, municipal and school combined. Um, so to put that in perspective, every 1% adds just over $1 million to our budget. Um, as far as drivers for our budget, uh, both uh, in fiscal year 24 and beyond, um, all of our school collective bargaining agreements uh, will expire uh, June 30th uh, of 20... Sorry, all non-school collective bargaining agreements expire June 30th of 23, so we're currently under negotiations. And all school uh, collective bargaining agreements will, will expire one year later on June 30th, 2024. Um, 
Under our, one of our fixed costs, our pension assessment, uh, we have a FY24 actuarially determined contribution of, for uh, all town or all uh, Cape Towns of 83.4 million. Uh, the town's share of that is uh, 12.4 million. Um, the funding schedule provides for a 5.8% increase, increase um, of that value each year. So uh, right off the bat, we're looking at about a $600,000 increase uh, year over year. Um, the contribution amount is based on the community's uh, covered payroll. Um, so each October, we submit a report um, to the Retirement Association, um, us along with every other community in, on the Cape. Um, and we're looking at about 15.58% uh, of that um, total assessment. Um, this is a, a variable assessment in that a percentage change in our covered payroll, whether it be um, our payrolls going up or our surrounding communities going down can heavily influence that assessment. Um, so as an example, a 1% change in that uh, assessment of that covered payroll could add $1 million to that assessment. So it's, it's something we monitor very closely. Um, the, the report is put together very thoroughly every year and reviewed multiple times, and uh, we work with, with the county to ensure that that's done accurately. And lastly, um, you'll recall the COLA approved for current retirees uh, will add an additional $70,000 to assessments in the future. Health insurance, uh, total budget about 13.5 million and that's based on our current 50-50 contribution split. Um, if we continue and look at a 70-30 split for active employees, uh, we are projecting initial, initial increase of about 1.8 million, uh, slightly variable in the fact that it's very hard to determine um, changes to participation um, of existing members um, if that, that change is made. As, uh, about 1% in rates um, can, and a one percent increase in rates can add about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to this assessment. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were looking at rates each year changing from between five and eight percent. Um, during COVID, uh, late rates were largely unchanged, uh, just due to the um, lower use of of those plans at that time. Our capital program, uh, we currently contribute about $15 million uh, in general fund, from the general fund each year. Um, 7.2 million of that is for debts, existing debt service for current projects, and uh, 7.8 million for cash funded projects. Uh, we increase our contribution to the capital program by 2.5% each year, and plus a additional 750,000 uh, from new growth. Uh, acceleration of our capital program will put pressure on the our, and CWMP will put pressure on our capital program and our abil ability to fund. Um, and in addition, um, working with the school department and our CIP process, um, they have just complete, completed their school facility study, um, which has identified about 132 million in identified needs at this point. Um, Another large cost driver on the expenditure side <clears throat> of the sea is utilities and fuel. Um, somewhat level FY19 through 21, uh, we're seeing growth in this cost category in FY22 and project and FY23. Uh, we pretty much level funded with slight increases in FY24. Uh, going into FY25, uh, we're looking at the largest driver being at electricity, uh, and uh, we're, we're coming off contracts, and we'll start a new contract on July 1 of 2024. Um, on the supply side, um, 
putting the commodity aside, the supply side, uh, we're projecting somewhere close to a 53% increase uh, on just the supply side charge. Um, our current projection will have a general fund impact of about $460,000 for the general fund and an enterprise fund increase of about 250000 As Mark had mentioned, um, the Student Opportunity Act has been um, put in place uh, around FY23. Um, this, while we are receiving additional revenue, it's also an expenditure driver for us because it now sets a new base for how much we need to spend year over year on education. Um, FY25's increase is estimated to be six million. Um, half will come from Chapter 70. We're projecting about three million, um, but the other three million um, will need to come from local sources. Driving our foundation budget is obviously our enrollment. Um, we have preliminary numbers for FY20 which we submitted to the Department of Education on October 1st. Um, we're looking at 4,889 students, and this excludes our out-of-district students, which is around 30 to 40 students off the top of my head. Um, so an increase of about 51 students over the prior fiscal year. So on the capital program side, um, this is a schedule that shows, or a table that shows what our capital project submissions were for the next five years. This is gonna be updated very soon. Departments are working on their new submissions for the next five year period. So 24 is coming off and 29 will be added. We expect an increase um, in the total dollar amounts that will be submitted. We were able to do most of the enterprise fund projects, um, about $22 million of enterprise fund projects were approved in 24, about 13 million in general fund projects, not the whole 50 million. And we did all of the 33.5 million in CWMP projects. So again, this will be updated, but this is a major reason why we're trying to commit more resources to our capital program because it is becoming larger and larger and that new school study will, um, add more projects on the school side of the capital budget. And how do we finance this stuff? Just like you or I would finance a large purchase of a home or a car, you're gonna borrow the money to do it, and that's what we do. We borrow money to do many of our capital projects. As I mentioned earlier, the cost of borrowing has gone up. Back in fiscal year 21, we borrowed we issued a bond, a 20-year bond, and it costs us about 1.2% on average for the interest rate, the best interest rate I think we've ever received. That shot up to 2.2% in fiscal year 22's debt issue, 3.2% fiscal year 23's debt issue. And we're expecting over 4% when we go out to the market this spring. Um, and just it's just a fact of the market's the way it is now. We can't control it. But at least having the AAA rating provides a little bit of cushion on that and maybe saves us a three to four basis, three to 30 to 40 basis points on that borrowing rate. And it's strongly tied to the history of the 10-year treasury rate. Whatever the 10-year treasury rate is paying is typically what we borrow at. And as you can see from this chart, that has gone up. It continues to climb. And as of the October 2023, it's in excess of 4%. So that's the basis for our assumption that we can expect about a, over, just over a 4% borrowing rate um, when we issue our next bond. Looking at our capital trust fund, which is the main tool that we've put in place to manage our general fund capital, we think we could manage about another $50 million in new borrowings over the next five years to fund general fund projects. We can, we have the capacity for about $4 million annually in cash funded projects. We have about $175 million in capacity for new loans for the CWMP program, largely attributable to the almost $6 million that we've committed towards in general fund um, uh, revenues committed towards that program. 
And it also assumes that we're going to get these projects listed on the Department of, Environment, Department of Environmental Protection's intended use plan, making them eligible for Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund subsidies and the Mass Clean Water um, Trust Fund's subsidies and low interest rates through that loan program. So if those assumptions hold true um, and those events happen, we think we can finance about $175 million from this fund for the CWMP program. Most of our enterprise fund capital is going to be managed through rates and grants, grant opportunities. We receive a lot of grants, especially in the um, airport enterprise fund that pays for the majority of their capital program. Turn it back to Gareth to wrap it up here. Um, to review our proposed policy agreement for the fiscal year 25 general fund revenue allocation. So annually we uh, get together and we look at how we are going to uh, share revenue and fixed cost expenditures uh, going forward when developing the budget. Um, so we start with our revenue sharing agreement. Uh, generally speaking, the first step is to look at the growth of the revenues and reduce that by uh, any increases in fixed costs. Um, included in those fixed costs are contributions to the capital program, as I had said earlier, the 2.5% increase plus the 750000 in new property growth. And um, remaining growth, revenue growth is then split 60-40. Re savings accounts, um, returned appropriations from either the school department or municipal departments are returned to so-called savings accounts um, for benefit of those departments. And any excess revenue generated, uh, any excess revenue generated over budget estimates and returned appropriations of fixed costs are then split 60-40 um, to the school and municipal savings. Uh, the use of the savings for FY25 operating and capital is subject to, bonds to the uh, town council appropriation. So looking at our general fund revenue growth, um, we're looking at total revenues of uh, growth of about just over $14 million or 7.28%. Uh, again, our largest category growth will be $4.1 million in property taxes, uh, and then down to state aid at just over uh, $2.6 million. Um, our current projection includes uh, general fund savings use of just over uh, $4.2 million uh, for potential snow and ice deficits and health insurance contribution changes. If we look at our, how that, uh, then we look at our assessments, sorry. Um, changes in our fixed cost assessments, uh, we're projecting at this point just over $7.4 million, um, the largest change being in employee benefits and other fixed costs. Um, that will leave approximately $6.9 million or an increase of 5.31% over FY24. Splitting that 60-40, uh, we're looking at uh, just over $2.7 million uh, for the municipal budget change and uh, just over 4.1 million, 5.02% increase in school operations. Um, again, for a total increase of uh, 6.9 million. Our savings account, um, again, uh, we had this certified uh, earlier in the month, um, certified as of July 1, 2023. We are up to just over or just under 33 million, um, an increase from our July 1, 2022 balance um, of 26.7 million. Uh, returned appropriations um, for both municipal and school departments totaled just over $2 million. Returned appropriations for fixed costs were just over 1.7 million. And as Mark had mentioned, uh, excess revenue of just over 8.6 million. So again, a certified balance of July 1 of 2023 of just shy of 33 million. And that's it, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So as always, thorough, appreciate that. Um, and now I would open up for questions. Um, 
Looking to my left, any questions? Councilor Neri, please. Thank you, President Levesque, and thank you for the uh, presentation. Very informative. I've got just a couple um, questions. You're in negotiation with non-school CBAs. I'm just curious, uh, like a time frame, I know it's maybe a moving target, but when might you anticipate that that might be brought to a head? Um, I think by the, probably the end of November, we'll probably be settled with all of them. I hope they're going well. <laughs> thank you. Second, um, just a couple of things that I kind of picked out. Uh, electricity costs, since 2019, they're up 40%. And if I heard right, they may be up another 53%. Is that what, where, did I hear that right? The supply side um, of the electricity costs, yes, is going to go up 53%. We are part of the Cape Light Compacts Consortium, mm -hmm. and we participated in a new two-year electricity um, rate RFP. Um, the bids came in, and the cost is going up the supply side of the cost, which is about half the bill. Yep, is going to go up about 50%. Do you, do you know, just by uh, curious, what the cost per kilowatt hour was in the, the present um, contract we had and what it, what it may be going to? That Any number idea? I don't have with me, but I can get it for you. I uh, have the numbers from curious. the bid. I'm curious. And then you had a quick slide. It kind of went by fast, but there was a uh, um, uh, over 90% change. It, it was listed on other revenue um, in the capital trust. I'm just curious. It was up like one, two. You mentioned the first two, but there was another one that was up quite significant. It was maybe three slides back. The capital. I'm just curious what makes up that other revenue change. Next one. Um, other revenue? There you go, yeah. Investment Nine. income. We are, we are increasing our estimate for investment income. The treasurer is doing a fantastic job. That's good news. Thank you. And just so everybody knows, I'll go through the councilors and then I'll hand it over to uh, Chairman Judge and then he can go ask if any of the school committee members have questions. So any other councilors on to my left? Council Mendes, please. Uh, thank you, President Levesque. Just a quick question. Um, what metric do you use to determine the projection for building permits? We look at um, historical trends, and then we, we, we talk to the building commissioner about what's in the pipeline. And right now, there, is, there are some large projects in the pipeline. Like was mentioned earlier this evening, the housing development potential at, um, at the old former TD Bank building. Mm -hmm. And so we, we talk to him about what does he see out there and what's he got for anticipated significant building um, that's in the pipeline for permitting? And based upon that, we think we can continue with, uh, we're going to see some growth in that area. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mendes. Any other questions to my left from the councilors? Looking to my right, any questions from the council? Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque, and thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> Um, I am pleased that the town now has a grant writer. Does the grant writer serve both the school department and the town side of the house? I think the school department has their own staff that is that does a lot of most of their scant grant writing. Interesting. Thank you. Um, and um, <clears throat> when will the debt for the Cape Cod Tech School retire? About twenty years from now. Oh. It's a twenty-five year note. Thank you. Got to wait for that. Thank you, Councilor Clark. Any other questions? Councilor Schnepp, did you have your hand up? Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of information, and, and this is probably my sixth, fifth or sixth time hearing a lot of it, so you would think I have a good handle on it. But in future presentations, I would love to get this ahead of time because it's really hard to go back and you know, pick out the questions uh, with all the data points that you have provided us tonight, but, but thank you. Uh, could you spend a little bit more time on the impact of the rising interest rate environment? Um, we're looking at a lot of debt going forward, and so I'm wondering where's the tipping point between the investment income that's obviously increasing and the increasing costs in our debt? Certainly. Um, yeah, it, this, you know, we, we see an upwards trend in borrowing rates. Um, 
all indications right now appear that the Fed's going to stop what they're doing. There may be one more rate hike. Um, and then that's it. And so I think we'll see interest rates level off beyond that. And then most likely in outer years, they'll probably start coming back down once we have some, you know, economic uh, contraction. They'll adjust those rates back downward, which will impact us in lower borrowing costs in the future. But about every 1% increase in rates generally Completes our purchasing power by 10%. So we could have borrowed 10 million at 3.2%. We can only borrow 9 million at 4.2% for the same annual loan payment. That's about the, the fiscal impact for us. Um, but certainly, if it costs more to borrow, we're going to be able to borrow, we're going to be able to issue fewer loans because of the loss of the net purchasing power. But that could be offset by making increased contributions to the capital program, which is what our intention is. We continue down that path to try to push more and more of our revenue growth in the general fund into the capital side of the budget before we have anything, before the remainder is allocated to the operating side of the budget. Okay. So in fiscal 25, we have a very large possible obligation, 135 for the CWMP. Um, I also heard mention of a completed uh, school facilities need study uh, of 132 million. I have no idea how that's going to translate into capital needs in the future. Do we have any idea when that might, information might be coming before us or before the school committee? That'll come before you in the spring. Um, departments will be are working on their capital submissions now, including the school department, based on that study that they had done. Um, their submissions are due in November. We go, we'll have a process where they'll be vetted by a capital task force. Uh, we'll have a meeting in December to ask questions about specifically more about the projects that they're requesting funding for in fiscal year 25. We'll go through the process of prioritizing um, those projects, usually projects that, that are related to public health and safety are rated the highest and they usually end up receiving funding before other things. Um, but that's all part of the capital review process that we, that we go through before we bring forward to you the capital program um, submit to you a capital budget sometime in the March time frame. And it is always a challenge on the town council that we sort of get the decisions arriving at our dais. And so it, it'd be great if we had some information ahead of time. Because I'm wondering, it looks like you know, we've been able to put off a debt exclusion for the capital, for the comprehensive waste man water management plan to date. Sure. So when we get all those submissions from the departments, we will share all those submissions with you ahead of time. So you can see what the departments are submitting. Okay. But again, I'm wondering, you know, oftentimes with large school projects, whether it's adding actual new school buildings or, I mean, I don't know what we're talking about. If everything is just a, a renovation of existing school buildings or if we're talking much more expansive planning. Yeah. And yeah. that would require, you know, a debt exclusion for the schools. And again, that might be in a future conversation. Can I just... President, uh, just hand it over to uh, Chairman Mike Judge. So, just so so, the um, facilities um, report that we got in has nothing to do with adding; it's maintenance. So it's it's not, um, and and just as um, Mr. Mills said, um, it is. They rated it in one, two, and three, I believe, and uh, one's worth zero to three years is what they were giving us a timeline, so the most immediate ones. Um, then I think it was three to five years was the twos, and then, Mike, five to eight years was the, so it's like kind of over an eight-year plan. Okay. Does that, does that kind of help you a little bit? Very much. Yeah, I, so I, it's, it's, I, I, I want to say uh, 132 priority ones. Is that correct? 72.8 million for zero to three year priority ones. 
that's and then it went up and so the whole 132 million was over an eight year period and it was the 72.8 for zero to three years is what they forecasted so does that make it kind of it it puts in perspective just what, what you're talking is. for a timeline right right I, I know that there have been a conversation or two about whether the existing school school layouts are adequate for the needs of our school po student population so and I, that's a whole nother conversation yes. <laughs> this report and just just and i understand because we i understand that you want the information as soon as so us as a school committee just got the facilities report um and had a couple of meetings about it in the last month so this is fresh to the school committee so just so it's not like we got this last may and it's just coming through and it's like well wait wait a minute where is it for the town council we got this literally a month ago we had it at our last like the last two school committee meetings i think uh, where it was a double like a two-sided presentation and then we had a, a workshop on it uh the end of september so that's it's still fresh coming to us mm -hmm. so that's kind of I'm sure folks will be bringing it forward to you guys, but it just literally just came to us in the last month or so. So, thank you. And yep. and and my point is, it's more just that we and the public understand the you know that there's not just a sewer expansion project going on in town. There's also an aging school infrastructure that, in addition to the maintenance needs, there may need to be. You know, we we haven't had a debt exclusion for our schools in 25 plus years, right? We've retired the debt, we haven't had any, we've closed schools, but we haven't had any major expenses. So just wanted to put that out there. So uh, I think that's it for me right now. Thank you, Councilor Schnapp, and thank you for the explanation, uh, Chairman Judge. Any other council questions before I hand it back to Jim? Oh, Councilor Shaughnessy? I already went to this side. Where was your hand then? No, just kidding. Thank you, President Levesque. Director Milne, I wanted to know, I know you've mentioned in the past that one of our only untapped sources of revenue in the town is marijuana sales. Um, we've had a member of the public who's raised that issue at a couple meetings here. I wanted to know if you know, maybe based on what's happening in Sandwich or Mashpee, that if we were to bring that to the town of Barnstable, what will we be looking at in terms of a revenue projection? I can get you some numbers. I've I've looked at all the communities who've um, implemented um, recreational marijuana in the communities and what their tax revenue is over a course of a calendar year, and I can share that information with you. But I, I think Mashpee. When I looked at Mashpee, I think they generated a little more than a couple hundred thousand dollars um, from the marijuana tax, and so there comes a there comes a point where you know the market's kind of I guess gets saturated and. You know, if everybody were to approve this, you know, it just gets saturated and it's not, I don't see it as a significant revenue generator. Unless you go to Berkshire County and specifically Great Barrington. Great Barrington gets about $1.2 million in tax revenue because they're drawing people from New York State and Connecticut and Massachusetts. But those states are implementing legislation that allows them to do it as well. So uh, hopefully they didn't lock themselves into long-term obligations with that money. So definitely not a $6 million loss of revenue. We're talking hundreds of thousands. Yeah, hundreds of thousands. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you, Council Shaughnessy. Uh, uh, Madam Vice Chair, call him, please. Is that uh, just um, kind of um, piggybacking on Councilor Shaughnessy's, isn't the revenue from uh, marijuana earmarked for particular programs within a community so it's not like it could go directly into the general fund it would have to go to harms reduction or education or that's what I recall from years ago I don't know if that's still the case yeah there, there is a um, you can in addition to the tax you can charge a, a community impact fee the community impact fee I think is restricted for it has to be dedicated to certain things but the tax um, I believe is unrestricted <coughs> Council Clark, please. Thank you very much for this other opportunity to ask a question. <clears throat> uh, this summer, I attended the Cape um, One Cape Summit, and um, I remember attending a um, workshop where it was explained to us that um, 
properties on the higher end of um, the scale are typically under assessed, undervalued. Uh, that was a trend that was explained to us. I remember making a note of it and then it meant to um, address that at one time. So um, I don't know what's the best strategy for addressing that, if that's in fact true in Barnstable. Well, I think, I think our director of assessing has done a good job in assessing and, uh, and re reviewing the higher end properties and adjusting those values just based on the abatement applications we've been receiving from those homeowners who think that they're over assessed. Um, so we've, we are looking at those on, on a regular basis and we have seen significant increase, especially in waterfront properties um, in Barnstable. Thank you, Councilor Clark. Councilor Schnepp, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Gareth, you mentioned uh, in the slide on the pension assessments, remind me, is it just the uh, general employees that are included in the Barnesville County Retirement and the, the teaching faculty is part of the state pension? Is there? It yeah, that's kind of one of the best deals in town. All of the professional teaching staff fall under the Massachusetts Teachers Retirement System. And it's not part of our retirement contribution. So we, we don't have to make a contribution for that? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you have this number on hand, but did the assessment that was due in 930, I believe, to the county, how did that compare to last year's? I believe it's still being finalized at this point. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just curious with the number of vacancies we've had, and I, I just didn't know if we're staying about the same or if we're, we've had any significant change in that. Yeah, the, the retirement board will put together an assessment and they'll go through and, re and we'll be able to see um, our total payroll cost compared to the previous year, as well as our peers, which is probably the thing that's going to that's be good. the largest variable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Schnapp. Any other councilor questions? Okay, Chairman of the School Committee, Mike Judge, please. Andrea, do you have any questions? No, Peter, Kathy? Kathy, you must have a question. <laughs> no, thank you for the report. I think it was very comprehensive and very easy to understand um, the way you laid it out. Um, I have not been following it as closely as I should, but the 70-30 insurance split, is that finalized? And if so, when is it in, when will it be um, effective? It's still under negotiation and um, if, when it does get finalized, um, we anticipate an effective date of July 1st, 2024. And would you want to venture a comment on how likely it is? I know from... Part of us, negotiations. Yeah. Right, it's part, <laughs> part of, of negotiations. negotiations. That's, oh, it's in negotiation within yeah. your collective bargaining, so you can't yeah, comment. Yeah, so we can't comment. Okay, great. Thanks. I have no questions. I would just say thank you very much for the presentation, as always. Uh, I'm glad that we're back in person. <laughs> it's nice seeing everybody. Kind of, it's been a long time. It's been on the TV screen, and we're finally back together. So thank you, as always, and nice seeing everybody, and thank you for the presentation. Would you like me to close it, or do you have any questions? I just want to say thank you for the great presentation, and I agree with uh, Chairman Mike Judge. In fact, first time I ever met uh, Mike was uh, right over there at the <laughs> yep. first person meeting in 2017. So. Um, it is good to be back in person, and again, thank you for the presentation. Well presented and um, great financial status for the town, and it's very encouraging yeah. um, for both the town and the schools in general, so thank you for that. So uh, with that, oh, yes, Council Clark. Sorry about that. Um, will this presentation with all these figures be available under Council presentations? Thank you. Thank you, Council Clark. Wouldn't be a, a meeting without that. <laughs> So, uh, and with that, I'll uh, pass it over back to uh, Chairman Mike Judge for adjournment. So, can I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn the school committee meeting. I'll second. I have a motion and second. And roll call. Andre? Yes. Peter? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Chairs, yes. Passes unanimous. Blake. With that, we'll close our meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a five minute break while everybody gets situated here on the dais and we'll move forward.
Councilors, if we could please make our way back to the dais so we can continue the meeting. Yes. Honestly, Jana, it didn't bother me. You know what I mean? I have four children. No. Councilors, take your seats, please. All right, all righty then. While I'm waiting for the other councillors to arrive, I'm actually going to get, continue with the meeting. We have quorum on the dais. So with that, I'll just uh, wait for them. If, when they want to return, they can. We'll recognize that when they do. Um, again, great presentation. Uh, Finance Director Mark Millens and Deputy Director uh, Gareth Markwell. And always an important conversation. And thank you very much to the school committee for attending and joining us on the dais. And with that, uh, I would like to start with the town manager communications. The town manager report has been pre-recorded and available to town council and the public. The report will be prepared in written form and posted on the town manager's website. As in the past, the town manager and staff will be available to answer any questions regarding the report as presented. The town manager's communications for the period of October 6th through October 17th, 2023 include an update to one. A notice of special town meeting, council meeting on October 23rd, 2023 at Barnstable High School. Update on offshore wind projects. Update on budget action calendar. Update on local comprehensive planning committee. And five, reminder to the public that questions are encouraged to be sent to town manager for assistance in obtaining any information. I send, again, I will say that's worth repeating. Number five is reminder to the public that questions are encouraged to be sent to the town manager for assistance in obtaining information. So with that, I would open it to the council for questions in regards to the town manager report. Look into my left, please. Anyone? I will come back, though, in case you change your mind. Anybody to my right? Councillor Starr, please. Um, thank you, President Levesque. No, I just wanted to make one comment that um, the local comprehensive plan got 14 applications. I think that's exciting. Um, so that's, we need, there's, we need some more to boost up the attendance there. And so we have a good working group. So thank you. Great observation. Thank you, that yeah. Councilor Starr. Councilor Neary has once again joined us in the dais. He's moving around. He's to my right now. Oh. You're doing a great job. Uh, any other, Councilor Schnepp, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to ask Mark, uh, last meeting I did ask for a report on short-term rentals, and I just wanted to know when that might be available for the council. Hi, good evening, Andy Clyburn, Assistant Town Manager. We have been in discussions, and Mark Millen's been working with Brian Florence on the most recent DOR data, and we're probably tar targeting the second meeting in November to have uh, Director Florence and uh, his assistant, Jeff Carter, come and give a presentation, uh, kind of an annual update of where we stand. Okay, thank you. Yep. It's been a topic of conversation in, our, in the leadership meeting, just so you know that uh, I asked Andy Clyburn for that uh, last week, actually, so just so you know. Anybody else? Any other question, follow-up? Madam Vice Chair, anyone? Okay. Yeah, that's great. And um, 
I don't think I have any questions at this point either. And just again, another reminder um, that we are having that uh, special meeting with the voters on October 23rd at Barnstable High School. All are welcome, and that starts at 6 o'clock. So, um, and I just want to thank Town Manager Ells and his staff for assisting me in putting this together and making it um, a discussion, a sharing of information, and uh, I. We really hope to engage uh, many residents of the town in regards to this, these topics of these uh, offshore wind farms. So look forward to that. <clears throat> All right, with that, we'll close that. And uh, uh, Vice President Cullum, if you could please help me act on the limits. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting on October 5th, 2023 as written. Second. We have first and a second. Any discussion in regards to the minutes? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, if you could f signify approval by raising your hand and saying aye. Aye. <clears throat> any abstentions? One abstention. Okay. And now it is uh, time for communications from elected officials, boards, committee, and staff, commission reports, correspondence, and announcements. Anything to my right? Council Clark, please. Thank you very much, um, President Levesque. I did attend the Sandy Neck board meeting and um, uh, Natural Resource Director uh, Nina Coleman told me that she contacted Captain Awesome or whatever his name was um, to uh, follow up on uh, the uh, use of the halfway house on Sandy Neck and um, they're going to explore um, um, educational opportunities that is compliant with the regulations that they have for that now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comment announcements? To my left, anyone? Council Atzalus, please. So I think I mentioned this a couple of meetings ago, and I know I was way ahead of it, but Senator Stroll, December 10th, 3 to 6. The reason why I bring it up is we had our first planning meeting just a few nights ago, so I figured, you know, keep that momentum going. Um, secondly, I just wanted to highlight for uh, Tommy's place on Main Street in Centerville, um, they, do, they are, you know, on a we weekly basis on Sundays, they are looking for people to come and help, you know, clean and do turnover for the uh, guests who are coming in next so uh, they, there is an email they send out to their email distribution list. If you go on the Tommy's Place website, you can find it. You can sign up, and they'll send you an email reminder uh, throughout the week, um, and you can sign up for time slots to go in there and help. I was able to do it uh, once um, because of my commitment to my church on Sundays, but um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's not too much heavy lifting, but it's a very important thing that they, they need to get done to turn over for the next families coming in. So please take a look at that if you can. And, Anyone listening in the public um, and anyone here, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Atlas. Anybody else on this side? Okay, not seeing any, then I oh. would. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Council. Uh, could I ask our assistant town clerk to give us the deadlines um, for voting, please, in terms of when they can register, when they can get their mail in ballots, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, Right now we have um, in-person absentee balloting. Uh, they'll do that up until um, uh, the day before the election, Monday that, that, or that Monday before the election. Uh, we are doing uh, vote by mail, so they can get that um, sent to the House, so they can do that. Uh, that that'll be, uh, I think it's also uh, that Tuesday that, that that'll end, uh, so that uh, you're probably looking at October 27th and 29th as, as end dates for those things. Um, so that the, um, we can get the ballots out to the people and then they can get them back to us um, so that they can um, uh, be and counted. Are the mail-in ballots uh, considered valid if they're postmarked on the 7th? Yes, yes, but it, I think it has to be um, before 12 o'clock. So yes, it would be Octo um, November 7th, yes. Okay. And then there's a couple of days that we can um, still um, uh, accept them, okay. as long as they're postmarked on the 7th, as you said. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thanks, for Councilor Schnapp. Any other announcements? Okay. And at this point in time, then, I would um, invite um, Director of the Airport, um, Katie Service. Welcome for an important announcement. Thank you, counselors, for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, obviously, you've seen um, over the past couple of weeks uh, the announcement of American Airlines adding routes 
in 2024 to Cape Cod Gateway Airport. So I wanted to give a quick overview to the council to identify what that's going to look like for us and just to give you some background as to how we got here. So the background, um, as you know, and I've spoke to many of you in the past, since 2007, the airport passenger activity and operations have been on the decline. That's not just new for us. There's a lot of airports that have seen that across the nation where they have seen um, passenger activity and operations decline in a non-hub situation, which is what this airport is. Uh, declines for us in particular are due to industry-wide pilot and mechanic shortages, which also is affecting the nation. Increased competition from the high-speed uh, passenger ferries also affects us more significantly so than other airports. And the loss of several airlines over the past several years, Colgan Airlines in 2010 and Island Airlines in 2015. Um, those two airlines alone uh, carried in 2007 uh, nearly 169,000 passengers to and from our airport. And that was a significant loss that could not be really recovered. Uh, Cape Air, uh, the remaining airline that was uh, at the time at the facility, um, could not uh, absorb all of those passengers. We did lose some of those passengers over to other modes of transportation. So in 2018, the airport embarked on a strategic plan and a business plan to help develop focus on turning the tide. We wanted to see changes in our operations also in the way that we do business at the airport. So we developed, uh, and you've seen this before, four major goals for the airport, to maximize general aviation activity at the airport, to diversify our revenue streams, to enhance the airport's image and branding, and to become a regional air transportation leader for the Cape and the islands. So implementing these goals um, has taken place over five years. They have really have helped accentuate and improve the activity at the airport. Um, in the five years from its inception, many of the goals have been completed or they're still underway. So just to give you an example, the uh, photograph on the upper left-hand side is um, an improved uh, Mary Dunn Way. It was a rehab and an extension to that road. It's the road that's on the east side of the airport. That has um, garnered um, increased interest in um, that area of the airport for hangar development. I am working on three leases right now for new hangars to be developed in that, in that area. So that proves that um, you know, maximizing that general aviation activity, getting general aviation, what I'm talking about is a mix of single engine, small multi-engine type aircraft that want to base themselves here in Hyannis. So that's proven to be uh, uh, very fruitful for us by improving that road. We put in uh, a number of uh, utilities and sewer connections, so it helps to reduce the development cost for anybody that wants to come in and develop hangars. Upper right-hand corner, diversify airport revenue streams. Obviously, we all know that we have a 49-year lease with WS development that's in place. Um, from Mark Milne's earlier slides, you could see that that's a big contribution to the town as well. Um, it also assists the airport in uh, dealing with the ebbs and flows of our revenues uh, for the facility um, and our expenses. It helps with that by having some non-aviation type of revenue uh, coming into the airport. And then, of course, enhancing the airport's image and branding. We uh, renamed the airport to Cape Cod Gateway Airport uh, back in um, 2021. Um, we also started a new and launched a new community event series, bringing a uh, number of our community members into the airport for special events. Um, a lot has to do with aviation education. Um, in fact, we just completed our third um, Southeastern Massachusetts Aviation Career Fair. From that career fair, I am on my fifth intern now at the airport, um, taking students from Barnstable High School, Monomoy High School, and um, other high schools that have been interested in aviation. Uh, one of our um, interns now is going to Bridgewater State University, where I went uh, for pilot training. So it's good to see our youth uh, kind of moving up through the ranks. And lastly, as part of our overall goals for our business plan were to become a regional transportation leader. Um, examples is adding American Airlines to our flight offering partnerships. Um, this has been a long time coming. You can see um, these are just articles from last week. You can see that you know it was a long-awaited win for, for Cape Cod. We have been talking to American Airlines for about five years now. Many of you have heard that I speak about these events that I go to that are called 
um, the airline and airport events, but more like speed dating for airlines. You go and you pitch your airline for about 20 minutes, identify to them why it's important for them to consider your facility to offer their services. Um, I've been doing that for five years, and obviously it's finally paying off. Uh, we also have studies that were completed in 2018 and 2019 that identified year-round residents, about 215,000. That's probably increased after COVID, so we'll have to do the study again. But identifying that, a lot of those Cape Cod residents use other airports for their transportation needs, so they're going to Providence, they're going to Boston. Um, with American Airlines here, JetBlue and Cape Air, now we have more capability for our Cape residents to fly right from here. So a little bit about uh, American Airlines and their particulars. So when will service begin? It is a seasonal service right now. We hope that that changes in the future. Right now it's June through September. June 5th, daily flight service to and from New York's LaGuardia Airport will begin. JetBlue also offers a LaGuardia flight as well. Uh, June 22nd, daily flight service to and from Washington DC uh, Reagan Airport, which is great. It puts you right in downtown DC. Um, they'll be flying an, air, an E-175 aircraft, slightly smaller than a JetBlue aircraft. Uh, based on the model, it accommodates anywhere between um, 72 and 75 passengers. And tickets will be on sale for our routes on the 23rd, so coming up next week. And you can just go to AmericanAirlines.com. My dad already bought his ticket, just telling you. Um, the upper left-hand corner is just a picture of the Embraer 175 that's similar to what you would be seeing uh, coming to the airport. American Eagle uh, will be the operator, or Republic Air uh, will be operating the flights uh, through American. Typical seating configuration is side-by-side, two-by-two that you'll see there um, for their uh, fleet. Um, lots of excitement has been flying around on social media. Um, a lot of positive feedback that we've been receiving. So those are just excerpts from actually articles that were posted by the Cape Cod Times about folks that are really excited about seeing the service um, come to, their, to this facility to be um, servicing Cape Cod. A lot of people do want to see direct flights to Florida. That has always been a comment that I receive over and over again for those flights. Uh, the beauty of this is you can fly right into DCA and you can get your connections to go to Florida. Um, direct would be wonderful, but right now at least we do have an option uh, for folks that want to do that. Um, and there's a lot of commentary that I've seen of, of people being happy that they don't have to go to Rhode Island, to Providence, or up to Boston, um, especially with um, the work that will be done at some point in time on the bridges. This is you know, something that is very near and dear to me to be able to find some transportation opportunities for our community. That's all I have for my presentation. Um, we're excited about this. We can't wait to start. We'll be meeting with um, American Airlines and their GO team uh, next month, and we'll start uh, planning for what needs to happen in the terminal for them. But any, any questions? I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, and you. congratulations Thank on you. the hard work and your staff. So looking to my left, any questions, comments? To, uh, Councilor Atzalus, please. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Service. Um, how long is the contract with American Airlines? So this? right now, um, the lease that we have developed is for a one-year lease with them. Um, we do have options for renewal for a total of five years. Thank you. Thank you, Council Hatzos. Anybody else like to comment, question? Look to my right, anybody? Uh, Vice President Cullen, please. Great job. It's been in the works a long time. I'm glad to see the airport viable in light of everything that's been happening here at Public Comment and other articles in the paper, I think it's really important, and I'm thankful for your leadership. You've been awesome since you started with us, so great job. Thank you. Thank you. Council Neary, please. Again, kudos. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of conversation, I'm sure, with a big outfit like American. Um, it, I'm, I'm sure this is outside of your, your uh, knowledge, but rates. So my daughter flew back to Colorado with my two grandchildren and her husband for 78 bucks this summer. Yeah. So I don't know what's going on through New York. She actually said it was a glitch in the matrix is what she thought when she booked the, <laughs> the tickets so booked a bunch of them. So, I mean, more, more flights, more competition. Hopefully we'll, we'll you know, realize some uh, reduction in maybe flight costs. That's what I'm hoping. I'm not actually. I don't have you know the the know how to determine how they're going to identify what their fares will be. But with two flights daily to LaGuardia, I could assume that flights are going to be pretty aggressive with both companies uh, to get that ridership. 
fantastic. Great job. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Neary. Anybody else? Again, thank you. Congratulations. Thank and you. Um, looking forward to that. I have, uh, I have some family in the D.C. area. I'll be looking forward to see, uh, see those flights happen. So thank you very much. Sounds good. Thank you. That's the end of our, <clears throat> took a long time. Thank you for those who are bearing with us there uh, to get through and to get to the point where we're actually going through the orders of the day. Um, and right now we will start our first item of old business. Uh, Council Shaughnessy, if you could please, item number 2024-045. Certainly, President Levesque. This is old business, oh, subject to a public hearing and a roll call majority of the full council. Item number 2024-045, appropriation order in the amount of $9,800 for the redesign of the Hyannis Youth and Community Center website. As read. Second. We have first and a second, and we have Director of Community Services, Christopher Canella, uh, here for the rationale, please. There we go. We'll try it again. Good evening. This is really loud. I don't know if anybody heard that. <laughs> it is. It's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the community service department was awarded $11,000 in 2023 with salary savings to redo this website. We've all gone through the rationale before on that. We had secured someone to do that work for us, and last minute they pulled out of that. We have uh, we put that $11,000 back into our reserve account. We want to reuse that money now. That's why I'm here in front of you today. We have uh, reserved a con a a contract and we know a vendor so we just need that money approved and it's coming out of the reserves which was recently certified at seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars and with that I'll take any questions thank you very much and uh, this is a appropriation so there's a public hearing is anybody like to speak on this item Director Point, does anybody like to participate remotely? <laughs> there is no one on Zoom for this item. Okay. If there's no objection, I will close the, uh, the public hearing and uh, open it up to council discussion. Looking to my left, would anybody like to speak on this uh, item? Anybody? I thought a little fake out on that side. Anybody over here? Okay. That's okay. So with that, um, uh, this is a roll call majority vote of the full council. Assistant Town Clerk, Jenna Murphy, please. Councilors. Atzlis. Yes. Clark. Yes. Cullum. Yes. Cusack. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Mendez. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnepp. Yes. Shaughnessy. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. It passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ganella. Thank you. Have a great night. Keep up the good work. Okay, with that, uh, next item of old business, uh, Council Steinhilber, please, item number 2024-046. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is item 2024-046, appropriation and transfer order in the amount of $3,500,000 from the general fund reserves to the capital trust fund. This is a public hearing, roll call majority. Second. First and a second, we have uh, Finance Director Mark Mill for the rationale, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Barnesville School Committee voted um, to use $3.5 million from its share of the General Fund Reserves at the June 7, uh, 2023 meeting to fund the purchase of the portable classrooms for Highness West Elementary School and Barnesville Community Innovation School. The item first appeared before the Town Council on your agenda on June 15th for first reading and referred to a public hearing on July 20th, 2023. Since the public hearing occurred after um, the end of the fiscal year, um, there's a timing difference. We had to change the funding source from the school savings account to the capital trust fund because you can't make any appropriations out of general fund free cash once the fiscal year ends. We just recently received certification of the free cash and now we'd like to transfer funds from back from the general funds uh, reserves into the capital trust fund to replenish the money that was upfronted by the capital trust fund for that project. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a public hearing. Uh, does anybody in the room like to speak on this item? Anybody like to participate remotely? 
There's no one on Zoom for this item. Thank you very much. I would close the public hearing. Open up to the council for discussion, please. Okay. Not seeing any, I move to a vote, please. Councillors. Clark. Yes. Cullum. Yes. Cusack. Yes. Levesque. Yes. Mendez. Yes. Neary. Yes. Schnapp. Yes. Shaughnessy. Yes. Starr. Yes. Steinhilber. Yes. Atzlis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Director Milne. Council Atzlis, please, if you could, first item of new business, item number 2024-049. This is new business item number 2024-049, authorization to expend a grant in the amount of $8,190 from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection for the purpose of enhancing the town's waste reduction programs. This may be acted upon by a majority vote. Second. First and second, and Director of DPW, Dan, Dan Santos with you for the rationale, please. Good evening, Mr. President, Town Councilors, Dan Santos, Director of Public Works. The town has been awarded an $8,190 grant from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection under their Recycling Dividends Program, also known as RDP. The grant award was made because of specific programs and policies the town has implemented to maximize reuse, recycling, and waste reduction. The acceptance of this grant will allow the Solid Waste Division and the town to enhance its waste reduction programs through the acquisition of recycling containers, recycling carts and recycling bins, waste reduction, and or recycling outreach and education materials and other related expenses authorized in the Recycling Dividends Program contract. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos. Uh, Councilors, any questions? Council Cusack, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Dan, uh, this is great. I just was wondering whether or not specifically recycling is used throughout this, whether or not any of this can be used in regards to our composting program. I would just like to make a plug for expanding that to uh, you and Supervisor Ragazio, but I just didn't know if that was excluded from this um, or not. Actually, for the last year, the bulk of this money has been used on our food waste uh, composting program, food waste uh, reduction, and we will continue uh, with bins, home composting, and educational materials relative to that. Great, great question. Anybody to my right, any questions and comments? Okay, thank you for that. And um, counselors, if you could signify approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. I believe that's unanimous. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank Have you. a great night. Councilor Clark, please, if you could, item number 2024-050. Thank you very much, President Levesque. This is agenda item 2024-050, authorization to expend a federal fiscal year 2023 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant in the amount of $33,316 from the U.S. Department of Justice. This may be acted upon with a majority vote. Second. We have a first and a second. <laughs> what, what timing, right? Yeah, I yeah, believe so. We have uh, Chief Chalice here for the uh, rationale, please. Good evening, Mr. President and town council members. Jean Chalice, Acting Chief of the Police Department. Uh, the department applied for and was awarded a federal fiscal year 2023 burn memorial justice assistance grant local solicitation from the u.s department of justice in the amount of thirty three thousand three hundred and sixteen dollars the grant has been deemed a disparate certification for al allocation to be distributed among two towns based on a prescribed grant formula for each town and the town of barnstable pd will act as the grant administrator and fiscal agent for both communities so for the town of Barnstable, $21,715 will be expended on taking proactive measures to collaborate, plan, and strategize our response to the largest and busiest infrastructure on Cape Cod here in Hyannis. And these will essentially be tabletop exercises through uh, working groups for supervisors to develop plans, strategies, and tactics to respond to major incidents here. And those working groups will be comprised of members from Barnstable PD, Hyannis Fire, Com Fire, Barnstable Fire, and they'll meet bi-monthly 
to discuss and develop co-response plans um, to pre-designated locations. And then along with the strategic planning, there will be supervisor leadership training provided through the FBI LIDA program. FBI LIDA provides a training trilogy and the FBI LIDA supervisor class is one of those three courses. For the town of Falmouth, which was the other uh, awardee, $11,601 will be expended on the purchase of an ATV. Falmouth Police Department's use of an ATV is extremely important to their agency Falmouth has south and west borders on the Atlantic Ocean and 70 miles of coastline and beaches that often can't be accessed by motor vehicle. There are also numerous wooded and conservation areas throughout the town that are inaccessible by motor vehicle and they have issues with illegal ATV operation throughout the town. <clears throat> uh, the Polaris Sportsman ATV will be a valuable tool for Falmouth Police Department and will greatly assist their agency in serving the community for both emergency responses and routine patrol. The acceptance of this grant will allow both the police department for Barnstable and Falmouth to develop programs and purchase equipment not currently funded in their respective municipal budgets. There's no matching funding required for this grant. It's a re reimbursement grant as expenses are incurred up to the total dollar amount. And the town of Barnstable, again, will serve as the fiscal agent and grant administrator and will be responsible for all grant oversight, grant reporting, reimbursement, and drawdowns. Thank you, Chief Salas. And uh, with that, is there any council discussion? Councilor Schnepp, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Acting Chief Chalice. Could you uh, give a few examples of incidents that you would be using this process for? For the table topics? Yeah, the table topics. So we would use that in case there was um, an incident, for um, example, if there was an active shooter at the mall or um, at the, one of the schools or if there was a hostage situation but we'd be doing it so that we were prepared to address a situation at a particular venue instead of a general training. We want to be able to prepare for each particular venue so we have a preset staging area and those kind of things so that um, each venue we're aware of the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the venue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Schnapp. Madam Vice Chair. I just want to say how nice it is to see you up here in this role. I'm thankful you're leading the police department. Thank you very much for navigating uncharted waters. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well said, Madam Vice Chair. Any other comments, questions? Just making sure. You're good. Okay. It's okay. Um, no, it was good. The exit was great. I know there was nothing else, so not seeing any other further discussion. Um, uh, council, please, if you could signify your approval by raising your hand saying aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Now I will leave. Careful on those stairs. It's a doozy. First step's a doozy. Council Schnapp, if you could please, item number 2024 051. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an uh, item of new business that may be acted upon by a majority vote. Item number 2024-051, resolve that the town council, town council petition the county commissioners of Barnstable County to formally discontinue a section of county highway at the intersection of Old Stage Road, Park Avenue, and Main Street in Centerville Village, as written. Second. second. First and second. Attorney Charlie McLaughlin for the uh, rationale, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, back with another discontinuance. Uh, this uh, particular area uh, was uh, will be the site of a uh, uh, important service manhole uh, that will obviously be uh, associated with the uh, CWMP sewer layout. Uh, when it was surveyed uh, fairly recently, uh, it was determined that despite the very recent discontinuances that we've just had that it was uh, outside of the sideline of the of the layouts that we uh, we had hoped would encompass the area of the uh, the uh, a manhole so uh, we are now petitioning uh, the county and they've got a hearing scheduled uh, uh, to go through the discontinuance process as we have with all the others and upon their vote uh, the town will assume title by operation of law uh, there'll be no uh, fiscal expenditure on this because we've been 
handling these uh, uh, maintenance uh, matters for uh, a couple of generations now. Uh, we, we look forward to your support. Uh, this will bring it within the ambit of, of town ownership and out of the county so we can do the work on site and certify title. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Attorney McLaughlin? Any questions on the right? Not seeing any counsel, if you could signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next item of new business, uh, Council Starr, please, if you could. Item number 2024-052. Thank you, President Levesque. This is um, an order of new business. Um, Maybe act acted upon by a majority vote. Uh, number 2024-052. Authorization to expend a fiscal year 2024 Coastal Resiliency Grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management Office in the amount of $92,579 for the design and permitting of the Sandy Neck Facility Coastal Resiliency Project. Second. We have first and a second. We have uh, Director of the Department of Public Works, Daniel Santos, for the rationale, please. Thank you. The Town of Barstable has been awarded a $92,579 grant from the Coastal Resiliency of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management. Uh, the grant will fund the remaining permitting and final design of the site reconfiguration project for managing coastal resiliency at Sandy Neck. Three public meetings were held from January through June 2023 to select an alternative for managing coastal resiliency and develop preliminary designs with community input for the project. The selected alternative involves moving the parking lot landward by approximately 75 feet, enhancing the primary dune and relocating the gatehouse to higher ground where it will be safer from flooding. The grant funding will advance the existing engineering plans to 95% design, obtain an order of conditions from the Barnstable Conservation Commission, finalize mitigation actions for unavoidable impacts to eastern spadefoot toad, prepare final 100% engineering plans and specifications, and continue public education and outreach for the project. The beach facility has experienced coastal storm erosion along the dune, protecting the parking lot multiple times. Since 2011, the coastal storm erosion has resulted in the town spending approximately $850,000 to Norris to Sandy Neck Dune with approximately 28,000 cubic yards of sand. This grant will allow the town to progress through the remaining permitting and final design of the Sandy Neck Beach Facility Coastal Resiliency Project. Funding supplements capital projects uh, that were outlined in capital improvement project plans fiscal years 20 through 24, 22 through 26, and 24 through 28. The town will provide a 25% local match in the amount of $30,882. Match funding will be provided through the fiscal year 2024 Capital Improvement Plan, Project 2023-073. There's no impact to the general fund or the Department of Public Works operating budget. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos, for the rationale. And uh, now open up to council discussion. Any questions to my left? Council Cusack, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Dan, this, this might not be an appropriate question for you, but um, could you possibly characterize what might uh, be considered mitigation actions for the unavoidable, unavoidable impacts on the eastern spadefoot toad? I don't have the details of that, but I can get that for you. <laughs> Vice President Cullen, please. Is there anything to do with the fish passage in here at all? I was asleep till I heard about the toad, and you know, here I am. No, okay, good. You're leaving the council. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> council Clark, please. Thank you very much, President Levesque. Actually, because I attended the Sandy Neck board meeting, I believe that um, uh, Natural Resource Director Nina Coleman mentioned that they might have to look for um, trade properties, acquisition of other properties that might be um, suitable for the um, spade, to spade foot toad. So that's Thank you. part of the ex explanation. Thank you, Council Clark. Council Starr, please. Thank you, President Beck. Um, so my, my question is, is this going to get us to the final, all the, all, through all the permitting process, yes. so we'll be shovel ready and ready to go? Yes. Excellent. 
Well, we've got to get the funding for the oh, project. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that's a whole other step, yeah. you know. Okay. <laughs> um, um, come yeah. back. But soon, yes, but, uh, design and permitting will be complete. Okay, excellent. I, I was, it's been a long process, but the public has been involved at every step, and it's, it's, it's been a, a great back and forth and redesign, and um, I, I appreciate the process. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on this side? I think it's uh, I think it's important though for the public to know that yes, we're moving forward. We've got the study. We've got um, a lot of this paid for, but in the end, when we become shovel ready, what is the cost of the project? Possibly, what it could could it be? Right now, the cost estimate is five point three million dollars. Correct. And how much of that could we get possibly in some? Well, we're hoping to get all of it. Okay. There's a couple of opportunities available. Okay. Both federal and state, and uh, we're pursuing those to the extent we can, and we're very hopeful. CZM has been very supportive, and I know. Well, I would hope that uh, we would certainly get a portion of this from them. Okay. And they have they are working with us with federal uh, agencies as well. Um, so. Great, and, and for the best. again, all the support in the world for getting that done, and I appreciate all the hard work done on this. Um, but obviously the project's not gonna be um, inexpensive, so uh, just uh, important for the public to realize, and not that it's not important, it's just that um, there is a, uh, a substantial cost to it. Um, so with that, any other questions, comments? Okay. Great. Um, then I would ask the council to please raise your hand, signify your approval by saying aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, staff, for all your hard work. Council Neary, please, if you could, item number 2024-053. It's my pleasure, Mr. President. This is new business. And uh, we will refer to a second reading on November 2nd, 2023. It's item number 2024-053, an authorization of a housing development incentive program tax increment exemption agreement between the Town of Barnesville and Atlantic Apartments, LLC, for 11 new market rate residential units located at 171 Main Street and 16 School Street, Hyannis, as written. Second. We have first and a second, again referring to a public meeting, uh, public, what? That's what I'm, I'm sorry, I just misspoke. Yeah, that's okay. We, yeah, a second reading um, on November 2nd, 2023. Thank you, Councilor Clark. And uh, so please, Council, if you could raise your hand, uh, say your approval by raising your hand saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Referring to a public, I'm referring to a second reading. Okay, moving forward, um, Vice President Cullum, if you could please, 2024-054. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to refer to a second read on 11-2-2023, item 2024-054, authorization of a housing development incentive program. Oh, so I'm reading a long one, but that's okay. Authorization of a housing development incentive program tax increment exemption agreement between the Town of Barnstable and Dunrovin 2 LLC for eight new market rate residential units located at 68 Yarmouth Road, Hyannis, as written. Second. First and a second, referring to a second reading on November 2nd, 2023. Council, if you could signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous. Council Steinhilber, please, if you could, uh, item number 2024-055. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to refer to a second read on uh, November 2nd, 2023, item 2024 055, authorization of a housing development incentive program tax increment exemption agreement between the town of Barnstable and CCR Holdings LLC for 10 new market rate residential units located at 50 Yarmouth Road, Hyannis, as written. Second. First and a second, Council, if you could please signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. That's a unanimous. <clears throat> Councilor Schnepp, please, item number 2024-056. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an item of new business, a first reading, and I refer to a second reading on 11-2-2023. Item 2024-056, appointments to a board, committee, or commission. Resolve that the Town Council appoints the following individuals to a multiple member board committee commission. 
Council of Aging, Janet Kramer, as a regular member to a term expiring 6-30-2026. Licensing Authority, Jessica Silver, as an associate member to a term expiring 6-30-2024. Second. First and a second, again referring to a second read of November 2nd. Council, if you could signify your approval by raising your hand and saying aye. aye. That is unanimous. <clears throat> Councilor Mendes, if you could please, under number 2024-057. 20, yeah, thank you, President LeBec. This is new business. Item number 2024-057, acquisition of an easement for sewer purposes within Maywood Avenue and Newton Avenue in Highness Port. May be acted upon majority vote. Second. First and a second, and we have um, Attorney McLaughlin here for the rationale, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, municipal sewer is currently not available for the properties at 25 Maywood Ave and 8 uh, Newton Avenue in Hyannis Port. Uh, the property owners, uh, Stephen and Leslie uh, Corrin and uh, Margaret and Michael Kerr, as trustees of the Kerr Family Trust, approached the uh, uh, Department of Public Works about the feasibility of connecting the properties to uh, the existing municipal sewer system, which uh, terminates about 250 feet west of the property on Hyannis Avenue. Uh, the DPW reviewed the feasibility and has worked with the owner's representative and engineer to uh, develop a design for municipal sewer extension, which will allow the properties on Maywood Ave and Newton Ave to connect to, munis to the municipal sewer. Uh, the property owners proposed to install at no cost to the town a sewer extension from 25 Maywood and 8 uh, Newton Ave uh, to the existing municipal sewer uh, on Hyannis Ave. The owners agreed to connect uh, the private property to town sewer and shall at their own uh, cost and expense design uh, the proposed sewer uh, extension and connection to DPW standards. Uh, the, the design plans and specifications should be reviewed and approved by the town engineer prior to approval, appro uh, prior to approval to commence uh, construction. The owner uh, will allow the uh, town engineer and representatives uh, from DPW to enter the property as needed to review the plans and conduct necessary inspections. Uh, the this location is included in the town's uh, CWMP, but is not scheduled for actual sewering until phase two. Uh, as far as financial impact, uh, there will be no uh, negative impact, but uh, in fact, the estimated cost of this construction of $100,000 uh, in, in a phase two will now be avoided, saving the town about $100,000 in 1920, uh, two, excuse me, 2024 dollars. Uh, we'd ask for your support on this. I'll just make note, uh, this tracks uh, very similarly the arrangement that we had with Cape Cod 5 a few years ago uh, in doing this, so treatment plant, uh, and we actually are working on uh, two other commercial properties on 132 that are approaching us in the same approach, so uh, same idea. So it's uh, catching on in popularity. So thank you. Thank you, Attorney McLaughlin. I, uh I was actually on the Zoning Board of Appeals when the, the Cape Cod 5, that pump station, it was kind of a, a brand new idea, and I actually yeah. read that into the record. So, yep. yeah, I remember that quite fondly. Good work on that. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Yeah. I, again, not much of a heavy lift on my part, but um, <laughs> great work by the town and obviously yeah. generosity of the Cape Cod 5. Yep. Um, that being said, um, Council, are there any uh, questions in regards to this item? Council Cusack, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Charlie, I just am wondering, you know, obviously we're saying no financial impact here, which is fantastic, but the design plans and specifications shall be reviewed and approved by the town engineer. I assume that's a nominal amount of time and effort. I understand it is, uh, and uh, they've been involved in the consultation on this program all along, and so uh, it will mimic uh, other uh, projects we're already doing in private roadways and so forth in terms of actual infrastructure, so not a, heavy, a lot of heavy lifting on this one. So, thank you. Any other questions? Council, start, please. A few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is the, it, now, is this going to be part, are they going to build a sewer, part of a sewer main, is this a sewer main connection? Does that make sense? I mean, is, is eventually it going to be continued down the road? I don't... Yes, they're actually going from in front of their properties out to the roadway and extending down 250 feet to the stub of the existing sewer. Okay, 
So it's so, so it so it'll be as big as we need it. Yes. Hopefully. Okay. Is it the, is it gravity feed now? Must be. I don't know that detail. I'm sorry, Council. I think it, it must be because. Okay. Um, okay. As long as the engineering department's looking at it, I yeah. I will stop. I believe it is gravity feed, but uh, I won't uh, stake the farm on it. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Tom Mangerell's, I believe it is, right? We don't have vacuum feed there. I don't, yeah. yeah. I don't know exactly where it is. I don't know where it is. Why wonder when we have Tom Mangerell's here? Yeah. Good evening, Mark Ells, Tom Manager. Yeah, the, um, basically, and it's extension, not a connection. So it would okay. be an extension of the existing sewer and in do meeting the specification of DPW. Um, I don't know what lies beyond it in the future off the top of my head, but um, it would be designed such that it can continue on. But you have somebody step up that wants to expend the funds that we would in the future to install what we tell them needs to be designed. So does, so. The, does the road have to be dug up and repaved? Uh, I'd have to look at the design to see. Typically, the sewer runs through the center of the road, but I'd have to look at this one and see. Um, the owner ex incurs all expenses associated. Thank you. Yep. We've, we've seen this more and more. There's another residential in Iana's board. Certainly, we see it on occasion with commercials. So they don't, you know, they're ready to go. It falls in the plan, and uh, what they're proposing is doesn't create a problem. It's anticipated. They just accelerate it. Thank you. It's a nice one. Our resident's partner with us. Council Clark. I just want to thank you very much, President Levesque. I just want to commend the Kerr family for, um, for jumping in and being uh, proactive on this um, sewer expansion and saving the town $100,000. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Clark. Any other questions, comments on this side? On this side, are we good? Okay. Council, please, if you could uh, raise your hand, signify your approval by saying aye. I believe that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman McLaughlin. Madam Vice President Cullen, please, if you could, item number 2024-058. Yes, item 2024-058, resolve delegating the town council president the authority to designate a moderator to preside over and regulate the special town council slash open meeting of the voters scheduled for October 23rd, 2023. Second. First and a second, and Attorney Karen Nover here for the rationale, please. Thank you, President Levesque, Karen Nover, Town Attorney. Um, as you know, a special town council open meeting of the voters has been scheduled for October 23rd. Um, that's a result of a citizen's petition that we received pursuant to Section 8.9 8 of the town charter. The town clerk has certified 358 signatures. Um, 300 voters, 300 signatures is what's required. Uh, the charter provides that the president of the town council or other designee of the town council shall preside and regulate the proceedings of such meetings. Um, we were looking to identify a moderator for this meeting. At the time this meeting, our town council meeting had to get posted. We were still looking for a moderator, so that's why we structured the vote as a delegation to the town council president. Um, but he has identified a moderator, which would be attorney Mike Ford, who is a land use attorney in Harwich. Um, he's also a town moderator for Harwich, and I think he's very comfortable and experienced in performing this role for the town. Thank you. Thank you, town attorney Nober, uh, for that. And so uh, any council questions in regards to that? Looking to my left. Did take some time to, to find the moderator, so hence, uh, but I'm very thankful for Attorney Ford for agreeing to do so. Councilor Schnepp. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I think it's a good choice. Uh, I think that this would, this is a good way to proceed that we have somebody independent from the council. Just to kind of a procedural question. If we don't have a quorum of councilors, does the meeting go forward? I think the meeting goes forward. It's not technically a town council meeting at that point. Um, we noticed it as a special town council meeting because if nine councilors do show up, mm -hmm. it is a meeting. And if we didn't notice it, then we would all have to go home. So that's why we did it that way. I think you could still go forward because it's an open meeting of the voters under the, under the charter. Uh, since some of us aren't 
aware of the details of the meeting? Is there any opportunity to share with us how we will be seated and what? I mean, I, maybe not within this item, but before we adjourn tonight. I don't. I don't mind saying it at all. I, obviously, the agenda has been posted. I believe we posted. Right, we posted yeah. the agenda. Um, if you did, you have a chance to take a look at that at all? It's okay if you didn't. We, what we're going to do is we're going to take the five topics of the petition, and we're going to break it down into half-hour segments. That's ideal. If there's extra time, we'll leave that time to the other items, possibly. Uh, there were five topics specifically um, placed in the petition, so that's why those five topics we adhere to, um, and it'll be held to those five topics. So uh, we will start the meeting uh, with uh, just myself doing a quick introduction, handing the meeting over to, um, not the, obviously introducing the moderator, uh, handing the meter over to town manager Ells, uh, the, so to give kind of a uh, why we are where we are kind of introduction, you know, uh, for about 10 minutes, and then we will get into the topics from there. Uh, and then after the topics of discussion, we're, we're leaving some time uh, on the agenda for um, the organizers of the petition to come up and give remarks. They said they would just like to give thanks and um, give some closing remarks in regards to uh, the, uh, the meeting itself. And then after that, uh, I wanted to make sure that each councilor had a, an opportunity to speak because um, it is, you know, uh, a town meeting if if they so like to i i did you know i do prefer that each counselor um, i'm limiting the uh, i put a limit of the public for four minutes per question and i would ask each counselor to also to adhere to that if possible um just i think that's fair so um, we may go over a little bit depending on how much council participation there is over nine o'clock but at that point in time the meeting would would close as far as seating goes um i i thought it was important that we weren't really on the stage i didn't want that um perception to be that we were over any of the audience members so i felt it was important to just to be on the floor um, the first row will be reserved for counselors um, and then at the the table uh, there'll be a table down below and that will uh, probably be counselor i'm sorry um, council cullum myself uh, town manager ells and maybe another microphone there for, to invite staff to speak there'll be a podium with uh, the moderator and then there'll be two microphones in the um, aisleways so that the, the public can speak and come and ask questions. So I hope that gives you, if anybody has any questions or further discussion, please. Councilor Cusack. Thank you for explaining that, Mr. President. Just one question about whether or not it will be broadcast on channels eight and 1072. So uh, I would, I know the answer to that question, but, but um, Director Poyant could probably answer better than myself. Thank you, Lynn Poyant, Director of Communications. It will not. Um, there is a planning board meeting that is taking place here in the hearing room, and that is what is designated to be broadcast live over our channels. However, um, we are recording the meeting, and we are people are able to watch it live by going to the town's um, YouTube channel for Barnesville Community Access, or Government Access, sorry, Barnesville Government Access channel. Um, and we have provided that information on the agenda. Just to add to that, there will not be remote participation, but there will be the ability to watch it. Councilor Shaughnessy, please. Just curious, do we anticipate that representatives from the developer Avangrid will be there? They know about the meeting. They're not going to give a presentation. However, they can uh, respond and they can comment. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Atzos, please. Um, since the permitting and decisions rest with the state, are any members of our state delegation uh, going to be there? State representatives, senator? They have been invited. They have been notified. Um, and I'm uh, well aware that uh, council, I'm sorry, uh, town manager Ells has also reached out to uh, Secretary Rebecca Tepper. Um, and I'm not sure if any response, uh, town manager Ells. Good evening, Mark Ells, town manager. Um, an acknowledgement that we've asked. Okay. I, I've talked to Rep Diggs. I've talked to Senator Sear, um, reached out to the secretary's office, 
Senator Sear has also reached out to the Secretary's office um, because I think, as you all know, the role of the uh, Energy Facility Siting Board is critical relative to any of these projects as they proceed through permitting. So we thought that many of the questions that are, really, that are directed to us, but they're really for the state, it would be helpful. Um, and everyone has acknowledged um, that's the best I can offer it. Excellent. Thank you, Tom Angelos. I appreciate that. Okay. Any other? Council Hatzos, please. I just ask that you save me a seat because I, I will tell you now I will be tardy. I have a previous commitment off Cape, and then I'm going to be in rush hour traffic from Dedham to the Cape around 5 o'clock. So please save me a seat. You'll Thank have you. a seat saved. I believe there's 15 seats in the first row. I appreciate so there'll it. There'll be plenty of room. Thank you. Anybody on my right hand side have any questions, comments? Councilor Schnapp? Now that I've had a chance to look at the agenda, uh, could you further clarify if town councilors are going to be invited to respond to each of the five areas or just at the end? Just at the end. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Council Starr. No, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I think this, we, we have to keep in mind this is a, this is a fact collecting exercise. Some of the questions we'll be able to answer, some, some staff will be able to answer, some we're just going to have to send to the, the siting board, some, some we're going to have to send to the proponent. Um, but we'll, hopefully we'll collect the questions, give the answers we can, and come back with the answers at some point. So, it's, so um, I, I, I foresee myself making no comment whatsoever <laughs> during this meeting. Thank Understood. You. Thank you, Council Starr. I'm, I'm glad we're having it, and I'll, I'll be there. Excellent. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay. A lot of hard work gone into um, the last couple of weeks trying to make this happen. So I really appreciate I have to thank um, Town Manager Ells, uh, Assistant Town Manager uh, Andy Clyburn, and really important um, advising me along the way as I map this out. Um, uh, Town Attorney Karen Nover, I really appreciate your help throughout the process. Thank you. Do we have oh. to make a motion about the moderator? The, the, um, the moderator? Or not, or we, just we don't. I mean, if you authorize me, you know, I obviously made it public that uh, who we chose, and but so if you do that, then you're basically approving that. You're approving me to do that. Well, yes, right. Oh, yes, we're going to vote this. I'm just saying he's asking if we needed to change anything necessarily. So that being said, uh, council, if you could signify your approval for item number 2024-058 by raising your hand, saying aye. So I think that is unanimous. So, and very th much appreciative of Attorney Mike Ford for um, for moderating this meeting. <coughs> Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. We got a second. second. We got first and a second. Council, if you could please raise your hand, signify your approval by saying aye. 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 Everybody, have a great night. Thank you for joining us.